Um, welcome everybody to the first NCFS in captivity of 2021, a year that starts full of promise. Um, and so i um, super excited to have our guest today. I am so happy to welcome, first of all, Andrea Goulet, who is professor of French and Francophone studies at the University of Pennsylvania and national co-chair of the 19th Century French Studies Association. She is the with author Susan. of <laughs> Sorry. With Susan. Um, she's the author of Optique, The Science of the Eye and the Birth of Modern French Fiction from 2006, and Legacies of the Rue Morgue, Space and Science in French Crime Fiction from 2016. She has also co-edited a volume on the BBC television series Orphan Black and currently co-directs the Interdisciplinary Humanities, Urbanism, and Design program at Penn. Her current book project is entitled Quakers in Paris, a transnational sect in 19th century French literature and popular culture. Um, perhaps to be featured on a future NCFS in captivity. And even when we're no longer in captivity, um, this seems like something that will um, be a nice thing that um, outlasts the pandemic. So stay tuned for that. Um, and in general, do keep us posted with any new publications that you um, wanna make us aware of. So Andrea will be speaking to Masha Belenki, who is professor of French and chair of Romance, German and Slavic languages, the chair, the department, the department of all of that at George Washington University. She's the author of Engine of Modernity, The Omnibus and Urban Culture in 19th Century Paris, another great book for your Paris classes, um, which came out in 2019, and The Anxiety of Dispossession, Jealousy in 19th Century French Culture from 2008. She's also co-editor with Anne O'Neill Henry and C Catherine Kleppinger of French Cultural Studies for the 21st Century. She serves as editor of Disneuf, the Journal of the Society of Disneuvianist, and she's on the executive committee of the MLA's Forum on 19th Century French Literature. And Anne O'Neill Henry is an associate professor of French and Francophone Studies at Georgetown University. She is the author of Mastering the Marketplace, Popular Literature in 19th Century France, which came out with the University of Nebraska in 2017. And she's um, the co-editor of uh, French Cultural Studies for the 21st Century um, with Masha from 2017. Um, another recent project includes guest editing a special issue of the journal Disneuf on the Parisian Universal Expositions from fall 2020. All of these are great for your, here's your whole Paris syllabus. Um, and um, she's currently working on, at work on a book that looks at energy production, popular culture, and, 19th, and the 19th century Parisian expositions. So with that, I will turn it over to them um, and don't forget to drop all your questions um, into the chat. We'll see if Bernie has any by the end um, and um, you guys can take it away. Thank you so much, Rachel, uh, for this lovely introduction. It's um, great to be here and it's really um, an honor to um, present this new, these new volumes to this um, wonderful group of people. Um, Anne, would you yeah. like to share the slide now? Yes. Okay. So we realized when we shared our um, uh, the announcement about our uh, books that uh, it didn't include a table of contents. So though we have uh, shared the news of the book, we have not shared to anyone what is in the book. So now, uh, before we got started, we wanted to read through the table of contents just so people would know what texts we were working with. Um, and then we'll go on with our spiel. Um, Anne, do you think you could click on slideshow? Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you. So, um, so we just want to give you a sense of what's in the book. As Rachel mentioned, there is a French annotated edition and then the English translation. So we start with um, several chapters from um, Paris ou le livre de, de saint -Ain. We have a, a chapter from Jeanne on Asmode, which serves as a kind of introduction to the whole volume, uh, followed by Gustave Doutrepont, Le Gamin de Paris. Uh, then we have Eugenie Foy, La Femme de la Mode et La Femme Elegante en 1833. Um, that is followed by a vaudeville play by Scribe, uh, Le Fils de um, l'Agent de Change. 
Uh, and that is followed by uh, one of the letters from Delphine de Girardin, um, from, uh, well, published in La Presse um, and then republished as Lettre Parisienne. Um, back to you, Anne. Yes. <laughs> um, and we have this very well choreographed, as you can see. <laughs> um, uh, next, we have a short story by Paul de Coq um, from his collection Mœurs Parisiennes uh, called Un bal de Grisette. Uh, then we have a couple of selections from Les Français Pain par eux-mêmes, including Auguste de la Croix's Le Flaneur and Balzac's La Femme comme il faut. Um, and then at the end, we have excerpts from three of the different physiologie. Um, that's the only part of the um, volume that has excerpts instead of the text in its entirety. Um, and it's uh, Louis Huard's Physiologie de la Grisette and Du Flaneur and Henri Monnier's Physiologie du Bourgeois. And later when we uh, answer questions, we can uh, go into the long saga if you're interested of why one flaneur has a circumflex and why the other doesn't, um, or we don't have to. So I'll stop sharing. Okay, all right. So um, um, we're going to give a little introduction. I'll start out by, um, um, by um, just talking a little bit about how this project came about, and then um, Anne will um, um, give a little introduction to the translation. Um, so like many of you here today, we have found that it very rewarding to expand our teaching repertoire beyond the literary canon. Works such as the Physiologie from 1840s or chapters from literary guidebooks such as Les Français Peints par eux-mêmes have become fun and reaching additions to more traditional reading lists for the last 15 or so years. Um, this volume came out of our shared conviction that reading novels by Balzac and Stendhal alongside writers such as Jules Janin, Louis Huard, Paul de Kock, or Eugenie Foy um, now largely forgotten, but extremely popular with the mid 19th century reading public, um, offers a more nuanced and textured understanding of this period. Um, also, they are, as you know, so fun to read. It's been exciting to introduce our students to these often quirky, humorous texts, which nevertheless teach us a great deal about 19th century French culture. Um, luckily, although the great majority of these popular texts have not been reissued in modern editions, many of them have become available thanks to digitization through sites such as Gallica or uh, Mediathèque de Lisieux. Yet, I'm sure as many of you know, using these online sources can prove rather frustrating. To begin with, anyone who has used Gallica can attest um, that the format of the facsimile editions can be unwieldy and logistic issues such as printing these works or handling their large size files can at times be a huge headache. Um, but more importantly, without extensive annotation, the myriad cultural references that these texts um, that are so rich and that make these texts so rich and appealing are difficult, especially for under our undergraduate students to understand. Would they know that a reference to Asmodeus meant a minor demon rescued for an, from an enchanted glass from Anna René Lesage's 1707 um, uh, novel Le Diable Boiteux? Would they understand that when a character is being carted off to the Rue de Clichy? It refers to the location of a debtor's prison, um, that the Terrasse des Feuillants was a fashionable place uh, for high society ladies to see and be seen, or that Robert Macaire was a popular character of a swindler founded throughout all of this popular literature. In fact, even as specialists of 19th century France, we often found ourselves stumped. What exactly is a panier skirt? What's with all the male characters coveting yellow gloves? Who is a sinecuriste? How do we make sense of a character named Jean Bonhomme, who, upon some digging, turns out to be a famous monkey? More broadly, we felt that without an introductory knowledge of the mid-19th century literary marketplace, these key texts were hardly legible to today's reader. And so the idea for this volume was born out of both the excitement for the material and a certain frustration with its accessibility in all senses of the word. Um, back to you, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So as we mentioned earlier, the project involved both compiling an annotated edition of the French text um, and also a translation of these same works into English. And since this was the first time that either of us had ever, had ever undertaken such a large translation project, we found ourselves confronted with a number of challenges. One main difficulty of translating texts written over 150 years ago is to make uh, is to avoid making them sound anachronistic, while at the same time rendering them readable and lively to modern audiences. For this volume, our aim was to have these 19th century popular texts come alive without losing the specificity of the time and the place of their publication, oh, excuse me, of the time uh, and the place in which they were written. Um, the works included in our volume were, after all, page turners at the time of their publication, uh, and so we hoped that our translation would convey this readability and the excitement that these texts generated. We tried to keep this balance in mind throughout the process, but it wasn't always easy. A good example of not relying on modern uh, phrasing or vocabulary was actually flagged by one of our excellent peer reviewers um, in our translation of Eugénie Foa's La Femme à la Mode et la Femme Elegante en 1833. We had originally translated uh, écouté, which the author writes before launching into a long explanation of this type as listen up. But in the end, on the reviewer's suggestion, we opted for a less American and less colloquial, you're about to find out, even if this was slightly less literal. Um, another issue we encountered was the fact that this anthology includes the work of a variety of authors, both canonical and now forgotten, who all contributed to popular literature during this period. This multiplicity of authors meant that we needed to convey stylistic differences. Um, instead of homogenizing the style, we worked to showcase each text's narrative voice. So for example, Jules Janin's Asmode is a very erudite text and Balzac's La Femme uh, Camille Font is rather bellatristic. Um, so as you can imagine, this is quite distinct from Paul de Kock's dialogue-based short story or Eugénie Foua's lighthearted social commentary. We needed to approach each text uh, on its own terms uh, and then make choices on, of vocabulary and uh, syntax accordingly. Occasionally, the original itself was a bit clunky, so the challenge to decide whether to smooth out the prose into more readable English sentences or to leave the clunkiness to convey the original flavor. Um, another big question we found ourselves asking was what to do with key 19th century terms pregnant with cultural meaning that a literal translation would fail to convey. When it came to the flaneur, the gamin, the grisette, or the rentier, was it worth maintaining the French or better to translate them into English? For some, the choice was easy. Flaneur and grisette are widely used in English language scholarship, so we left them as flaneur and grisette. For others, it was more tricky. We went back and forth on whether to use gamma or street urchin, but uh, in the end, thanks to the suggestion of one of our reviewers, we decided to keep gamma because street urchin didn't quite capture the full scope of the word. Um, in this case and some of the others, we added an introductory paragraph explaining the meaning and the history of this term. Um, so that was just a bit of the background on the uh, translation. I'm sure we'll go into this much more, but we wanted to jump right into Andrea's question. So we'll leave it at that. And now over to you, Andrea. Great. Um, I want to start by congratulating Masha and Anne uh, for this wonderful double volume. And um, I want to thank you both for making these uh, lesser known primary texts accessible in book form in such an entertaining and useful way. Um, it's the perfect combo of plaire et instruire. <laughs> uh, the project um, seems to have followed quite organically out of your previous collaboration, the volume you co-edited with Catherine Kleppinger on French cultural studies for the 21st century in that it also addresses the scholarly recuperation of marginal or ephemeral sources, right? Whose popularity or middle brow status had kept them outside of the canon for so long. Um, so my first question is uh, asking you whether you could talk about how this project relates both to the previous collaboration and to your own books on French cultural studies, um, especially I'm thinking of Masha's Engine of Modernity and Anne's Mastering the Marketplace. Do you wanna, do you wanna go ahead? 
Sure. So uh, the first thing I'll say is that um, the one of the main things that grew out of our collaboration with our uh, co-edited volume with Kaplan Kreplinger was just the um, fact that we realized that we we worked really well together and we enjoyed working together so much and we shared so many common interests and just really had so much fun together that we knew we wanted to do another project together. Um, of course, uh, in terms of my uh, my book, Mastering the Marketplace, there's a really direct connection. Um, I was very interested uh, in the uh, popular tastes of, uh, of readers uh, in 19th century France, but especially early to mid 19th century France. And so um, I had worked a lot in the book, uh, both on uh, panoramic literary texts like the physiology and the uh, larger literary guidebooks. Um, but I also had written a whole chapter on Paul de Kock, who is really one of my favorite authors from this period. And I had tried to incorporate them into my classes. Uh, I found that the physiology I could do with more success, but Paul de Kock, I really struggled to teach with students. And part of it was based on kind of the, all of the cultural references and jokes that didn't quite land. <laughs> um, and so I really had always kind of hoped there would be some way that I could make them accessible to students, as Masha said, kind of accessible in all forms of the term, both give them a literal copy of it, but also uh, help explain it to them, to them better. So yes, this was, this was clearly uh, a, a direct link to earlier work that I had done. Um, same, same with me, and I also wanted to second what Anne said about our collaboration. That it was, you know, a real pleasure to, to to work together. And so now I'm frantically trying to think what else we can do next. Uh, um, but um, this project also grows out of my work on um, Engine of Modernity, uh, where um, I look at the connection between popular literature and public transportation in the 19th century and, you know, do a kind of deep dive in all kinds of, you know, ephemeral popular texts. And um, part of um, the impetus for the, for the project was to sort of bring out, uh, you know, to a, a broader public, I guess, um, these really wonderful, exciting texts that have fallen to obscurity and, and um, you know, trying to think methodologically how we can, you know, make them accessible, so. Um. Thank you. Well, you're, you're both making collaborative work sound so fun. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it's still relatively rare in our field. So I'm interested in how it worked in practical terms. How did you do this together? Did you co-write the introduction? Uh, did you delegate different sections or translations or split the work? So we both, so the initial stage was that we split up the work. And so, for example, with different chapters, uh, one person was responsible for doing initial annotation. And I have to say that we initially erred on the side of over annotating. We had, you know, a lot of annotations and then we ended up taking some of it out because it was too much. Then the other person would go over the annotations and then the best part we would meet over lunch and discuss it and each chapter really went through several rounds of, of editing um, um and do, do you want to jump in and talk about the translation sure so for the translation it, we kind of took a similar approach in that we each each person was kind of responsible for doing a raw translation of the text um, then we would we would trade. We um, I I don't think I've ever used Google Docs so much in my life. <laughs> we we would we would go through it uh, virtually on Google Docs. We would then um, meet up. We did a lot of reading the translations out loud to see if it sounded right. Um, with both the annotations and the translations, we enlisted the help of a lot of people from uh, colleagues to friends to family members. <laughs> we we uh, uh, tried to make it not only collaborative between ourselves, but with others as well. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was really a lot of, um, like you said, they were, there was initial designation of parts, but everything eventually was reviewed and um, edited heavily <laughs> by the other person. When we were writing the introduction, we ran into a, a kind of funny issue. We, um, so we divided it up initially and each of us took the part that we knew the best. 
And uh, after we pulled it all together, we realized that the part that we wrote was in fact heavily plagiarized from our own previous work. So then we had to switch places and rewrite the other person's <laughs> section in a different language because, you know, otherwise we, we, we couldn't really come out of, you know, using the same words over and over again. So that was kind of a funny, funny moment. Well, I have to say the end result feels very successful. It's a, you have a unified tone and a unified voice. And the translations I found were really well done. Um, Anne has already given a couple examples of, of trickier moments, but I'm wondering too about some of the formal uh, challenges in the translation. So for example, in the vaudeville, there are some rhymed songs that must have been, um, a challenge, and uh, if you can sing them for us, that that will be very welcome. Um, but also, you you mention the importance of wit in a lot of these texts, and I'm wondering how does one translate wit? <laughs> Hard. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm, um, I'm afraid there will be no singing today. Uh, <laughs> um, but we were lucky with the, so the vaudeville includes, as Andrea said, there's a number of, of uh, rhyming songs. Um, and I must say that I, it made me feel very extremely, I should say, impressed by colleagues uh, who've done previous uh, volumes in MLA text and translations that are volumes of poetry, because even doing these incredibly simple poems was quite challenging. They are, as I said, they're very simple. The rhyme and meter are, are very basic. And so that made it easier, I would say, than some, than doing other poetry, but it was challenging. It was very fun too. And we, I think we kind of would, we just enjoyed, we enjoyed doing it. So that was, that was fun. Um, the wit is, is another question. <laughs> it's very hard to, to do. Um, I don't know if you, we have, we have a lot of examples of, uh, uh, mistranslations <laughs> that we encountered um, and also examples that we um, are very, we're very happy with, but that were challenging as well. So yeah, so for example, when in, at some point, it took us a little while to realize that uh, an 1831 uh, text referring to a baguette that uh, the Ghana gets as a reward was actually not the famous bread, but a stick. Um, or, um, um, you know, uh, of course, in the original, um, you know, you know, various terms that would be italicized now would not be uh, italicized. So it took us a, a, a little a pas de caractère was not an indication of a lack of character, but uh, was a dance, a dance step. Um, and things like that. Um, I apologize. I hope it's not. I, someone, somebody's drilling something outside my window, and I hope that <laughs> it's not too audible. So I have one uh, quick example. So uh, that was uh, it was really challenging for us, but in the end, we're uh, we're happy with. So uh, in Delphine de Girardin's uh, lettre there's an example of when she is uh, accompanying a group of English women on a tour around Paris and they're doing lots of shopping and uh, they're having a, a whole a whole outing and they go into a hat shop. And so because it's uh, it's um, she's she's with English women, there's uh, an issue with a woman not saying a word in French correctly. So the passage in French, which I'll read, it's very short. Um, it says, il fallait encore six chapeaux. Quelle couleur choisira-t-on? Bleu? Rose? Je voudrais un chapeau fou, s'écria Miss Cecilia. D'abord, nous avons peine à comprendre que fou veut dire feu. Ce projet nous saisit d'épouvante. Les six chapeaux devaient, devant être parés, c'était affreux. Un chapeau feu, c'est une fantaisie agréable. Mais six chapeaux feu dans la même famille, c'est un incendie. So, there was a lot going on there. And how we decided to translate it was, uh, after many, uh, many versions, was the following way. They needed another six hats. What color to choose? Blue, pink? I want an inane hat, cried Miss Cecilia. First, we had a hard time understanding that inane meant inflamed, as in flaming red. 
A flaming red hat is a pleasant novelty, but six flaming red hats in one family, that's a wildfire. <laughs> that's a great example. Um, and, and, and Masha's example of the baguette, which actually meant something different 200 years ago, uh, brings me to a question I wanna ask about anachronism. Um, a lot of my students seem to have trouble um, really believing that things were different 200 years ago, or they project backwards, right? Um, but with your notes, your explanations, and even in the choice of text that you made, um, you really emphasize the cultural and temporal specificity, right? I, I feel like you bring your readers onto the streets of 19th century Paris with very specific details about, you know, the, the yellow glove of the dandy, as you said, or about exactly how much a grisette had to pay for lamp oil and chestnuts and, and patisserie to have a party, right? Those are um, amazing specific details that pull us back and avoid anachronism, right? Um, but I have a, a double question about that. So first, did you find any examples um, other than the ones you've brought up that of concepts or phenomena that really resist any parallelism with today? And then kind of the opposite question, were there moments that do resonate with contemporary issues? Well, I'll start with the second part of your, <laughs> of your question. Um, I, I think part of why I love the, the 19th century, why I love teaching the 19th century is, is because it's so relevant. And so many of the themes of you know, social mobility, social aspirations, you know, even you know, questions of gender, I, 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 to me, they really resonate. And I think that, um, you know, when we teach these texts, you know, um, you know, when, when we are teaching, you know, when we're discussing a text, you know, the physiology du bourgeois, and, you know, you have this guy who is trying to make himself look so much more sophisticated than he actually is. It, it, it you know, resonates with today's, um, you know, uh, comedy, with today's um, sitcoms and, uh, you know, just uh, today's culture in general. Um, in terms of, you know, I know that we're going to get to it in, in, a, in a little bit, but, you know, I try to make my students uh, make these connections through experience. So we read the flaneur texts and then I send them, you know, I'm lucky to live in Washington, D.C., so I can actually can make them have an experience of an urban, of urban flanery. So they go into the city and they come back and they need to write about the experience and make connections. And, and so what I try to do is I try to make them think through about what's different, but also what connects us to these texts, what extent these texts are modern and, and are you know, kind of at the heart of make, makes us what we are today. And um, I don't, Anne, do you have any thoughts about uh, you know, the, the kind of cultural difference um. I guess I, I think what I was thinking about in that, uh, in response to that is just that I think that we kind of erred on the side of not, not really trying to bring out necessarily any of the connections. I mean, uh, we hope that in our, in the context of our classrooms, our students would make those connections. But like you said, Andrea, I think we really wanted the extreme specificity of this time period to come through in the um, in the throughout the text and in the notes, and because of that, um, as Masha said at the at the beginning, we really over annotated everything, and we had included a lot of kind of analytical footnotes at that point, going through and explaining more what the kind of meaning of the, or what we felt the meaning of certain scenes or characters were. And we ended up taking them out because we felt like we really wanted the students to be able to do their own reading of the texts, you know, and be able to draw those connections uh, on their own rather than, rather than having our influence on that. It's a good balance, I find. Um, I'm going to read a question that Michael Garval put onto the chat, um, if you don't mind. Uh, Michael says that he also teaches a seminar in Paris, so he's looking forward to using these works. Um, 
That said, writes Michael, seeing your table of contents, I'm struck by how Paris centric it is. In my teaching in recent years, I've tried to get away from a more exclusive focus on Paris, uh, to look at France more broadly, and also to include the provinces and colonies. So he's asking you uh, to address your choice of texts and to what extent you could envision including popular cultural texts that deal with a broader geographic swath of French and Francophone experience? I, I think this is a great question. Um, you know, uh, well, part of it is that these texts were, the majority of these texts were very Paris centered. They responded to the you know, early, um, you know, moments of urbanization that, you know, can do a certain amount of anxiety in the regions. Um, sorry, can you hear me? Because there's so much drilling here. It's okay, all right. Um, and, and, you know, so that's one side. And, but then the other side is that, you know, a very practical reason is that the MLA text and translation has a very um, strict word limit. And so we had to make some really hard choices. Our initial list was much longer. We wanted to include more text, but we had to um, choose the ones which, and we can talk a little bit more about the choices we made. You know, we wanted to make, we wanted to include texts that were emblematic of certain phenomena and, and were representative. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we have some other ideas about, um, we can talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the, the uh, why we chose these texts um, in, in a little bit. Um, um, but, you know, maybe next time we can do the, another volume on Texte de Provence, and uh, that certainly would be, you know, very, very interesting. Um, Part two. Part two. Part two. I, I second the request that Michael makes for a, a sequel, a part, part two. We'll get uh, right on it. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing, too, that Jennifer Yi would like you to uh, tell us about your flaneur with a circonflex versus without. So Masha, if I'm correct me if I'm uh, misremembering this, but the main one of the main reasons was that the Physiologie du Flaneur um, did not publish it with a circonflex, and the uh, and the text by Lacroix did publish it with a circonflex, and so we had a we there was a really kind of material problem that we faced whether should we streamline them or should we publish them as um, as they were published. Um, now, um, uh, Masha, you might be better equipped to answer this one, but there was also uh, uh, Priscilla Ferguson had done a wonderful analysis of the spelling of the word flaneur, I think in Paris as Revolution, right? Do you want to speak to that, Masha? Yeah, so in Paris as Revolution, uh, Priscilla Ferguson does a, a beautiful genealogy of the character of the flaneur. And um, so she um, discusses how the character or the, the, in, the, in the early 19th century, uh, it was a kind of lowly uh, despised character and he was spelled without the circonflex. And as he acquires more and more sort of cultural cachet, you know, the, the circonflex appears. And so these two texts were published kind of at the cusp uh, of this transformation from the flaneur sans circonflex to the flaneur with circonflex. Um, Great. And, and Cathy Nessy, who has also brought us another variant on the flaneur through the flaneuse, uh, is reminding us that um, Gallica has uh, the final volumes of Francais uh, Pain par eux-mêmes, including uh, the provinces and the colonies. So that's a good resource. Um, and I, I want to give a little précision um, in response to, I think it was Maria Scott was asking about the format and language of the two volumes. So there's an English, all English version, which includes your translations of the primary texts and your introduction and notes in all English. But the French volume has the original texts in French, but the critical apparatus, introduction and notes are in English. So it's incredibly useful for um, different kinds of classrooms, which I want to get back to too. I'm not sure I can keep up with all the chat questions, but I'm going to come back to one of my own questions now. Um, you, you talked about the thoughtfulness with which you selected your, your texts to include. Um, 
one of the things you say in the intro is that you focused on the middle decades of the 19th century um, with an emphasis on social mobility in the post-revolutionary period. Um, and, and in that introduction, you say something that I found rather intriguing, uh, which is that for you, the popular genre of panoramic literature served as a direct response to anxieties about social instability. Can you explain or expand on that a little? Sure. Um, so panoramic literature, as many scholars have suggested, in addition to being a commercial phenomenon, which um, Anne has written so nicely about, uh, was also a way for the public to grapple with change in political and social upheavals, emerging modernity and urban transformation. And um, as everyone here, of course, knows, uh, the social hierarchy of the 1830s and 1840s was extremely complex with so many different subcategories of various social groups, the noblesse de, de l'Empire versus the noblesse de l'Ancien Régime, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these, so these texts were meant to give coherence to political and social instability through narrative. They sought to provide a reading map to new cultural codes by creating neat typologies of social types, and at the same time to offer moments of self-reflection to the bourgeois reading public, a kind of mirror image of themselves. Um, they meant to capture and hold and thus control the ever-changing social and urban environment. And so although many of these texts are notable for their humor and their light-hearted tone, um, we should not underestimate their significance as fa fascinating sources of sociological and cultural understanding both for us modern readers, but also uh, for, as a source for 19th century readers to understand themselves. And of course, all of these texts are deeply inflected by the author's class and gender biases. And, and um, that could be one of the interesting avenues to explore uh, with students. Uh, you know, one example, for example, is Balzac's uh, In Femme Comme Il Faut, where he essentially creates a type of a modern woman and, and a post-revolutionary uh, woman, uh, of, you know, female type, in, in which you can see both Balzac's nostalgia for the Ancien Regime way of life and a fascination with the modernity that this type embodies. Um, That's great, thank you. Anne, did you want to add something or? I, no, I... <laughs> that was, it was uh, well answered. I'm, I'm seeing that Jennifer Forrest has a question about illustrations and whether you addressed the visual component of uh, the physiology, for example. So we do in both in the introduction, we, uh, we talk about developments in uh, illustrations in popular, uh, in popular literature of the period. Um, and then we also include a number of illustrations in the volume itself, um, uh, an illustration from the one, the text that Masha just mentioned, Balzac's La Femme Camille Faux, um, and a number of illustrations from the Three Physiologies as well. Thanks. Um, you, you address in your introduction the, um, the choice of lowbrow or popular literature in relation to highbrow or canonical literature. And I found that um, by starting with Jules Janin's Asmode, you really kind of set up a great fusion of high and low because that text refers directly to a whole history of canonical literature, right? So in your notes, you explain to the reader who was La Fontaine or Moliere or Rousseau and what did they write, um, which seems to me a kind of brilliant sideways way to teach students the high canon, but through the popular literature. Um, and, and, and that leads me to my final set of questions, which is about the pedagogical uses of this volume. Um, Masha, you already talked about taking the students outside and having them uh, embody Flannery on the streets of DC. But um, are there other ways that you could see using these texts, using your volumes? Um, if you've taught them before, what has worked? Uh, and also practically, 
what sorts of departments or courses do you envision um, as, as using these? So I'll just, well, wanted to pick up on one thing that you said uh, uh, really quickly, which is I think I completely agree that Jana, like starting with Jana is, uh, it, as you put it so nicely, kind of a nice way of showing the fusion of highbrow and lowbrow in that period. And the kind of uh, fluidity between those categories is something we talked a little bit about in the introduction. And there are other good examples of that as well, like the text that Masha just uh, mentioned, La Femme Comme Il Faut, which is published in this really commercial, Le, Les Frères Pins Par Eux-Mêmes, but also then recycled into uh, uh, Autre Etude de Femme. So it's a kind of a good way to show students that uh, it's maybe quite as cut and dry as, uh, you know, someone like Sainte Beuve might have wanted us to believe. Um, but uh, yes, we've, I, I mean, Masha and I will both talk about this, but we, um, we've both used uh, many uh, excerpts from this already in our classes. Uh, it's true, there te has tended to be a bit of a Paris heavy focus uh, in some of my courses. Um, I've taught uh, excerpts on the two excerpts on the Grisette in a course I taught on women in 19th century France. Um, and it's nice to pair, it's nice to pair the uh, the more popular text with uh, another more canonical one where you can show them that different authors are talking about the same ideas. So looking at, for example, a character like Fontaine next to the Grisette, uh, Physiologie de la Grisette or Ambal de Grisette or um, Ida Gruget in uh, Balzac's Ferragus next to the, um, the uh, Flan, uh, excuse me, next to the Grisette. So there are kind of natural pairings like that. Um, I've predominantly taught it in a uh, sort of gateway or upper division 19th century courses, um, but I think any kind of, you know, general uh, survey course could work well, um, you know, a course on a, a, a course, whether in our French department or non-French department on Paris, on 19th century cities, um, a course on humor and literature was one that we thought of. Um, Masha, how about you, if you wanted to mention some of your courses? Yeah, so, so um, you know, you, you know, upper level um, courses in the French department, but, you know, I was just thinking that um, my son, who's a, a college senior, is going to take a course uh, called um, uh, Spectacle of uh, uh, modernity in France. And I was thinking, hmm, I think I should write to his instructor and tell her to include our book. It could be really useful. Um, but so I've taught it in courses um, such as, you know, Victor Hugo in the 19th century, Windows on Paris. Uh, last semester, I taught a course called Power, uh, Politics and the Press. Um, and uh, we read Delphine de Girardin. Um, um, like Anne, I like pairing these uh, these texts with you know more canonical texts. For example, you know the Flaneur texts could be paired with any Balzac and Baudelaire. Uh, you can pair the Gamin de Paris with you know sections on Gavroche from um, from uh, Les Misérables. Um, you know any course on you know um, La Parisienne uh, could you know certainly. Um, uh, use many of these texts, um, um, you know, Eugénie Foy, uh, Delphine de Girardin, Balzac, and, and so on and so forth. So I think it could be pretty versatile. Um, I would imagine that in courses on comparative literature, the, uh, you know, 19th century courses in comparative literature departments, they could also, you know, use the English edition. Um, Absolutely. And I think everyone here today is going to go out and get these books and use them in our classrooms. Um, a lot of uh, the names I see are, uh, as I am, interested in cartography. So when I was reading your uh, explanatory notes about places, you know, restaurants and cafes and uh, theaters and streets and quartiers, um, it made me think it would be fun to have students map, right? itineraries uh, onto contemporary Plan de Paris. Um, I was, I'm, I'm looking at the chat uh, because I wanna open it up to other, other questions if people have them before we run out of time. Um, I see that Susan has posted the discount code so that all of you who are excited uh, to bring this book into your uh, research and your teaching, um, you can order it now. Um, are there any other questions from the 
general audience that you'd like to address. Otherwise, I think I'm gonna just ask um, Masha and Anne if there's anything else that you'd like to bring out or, or talk about that I haven't uh, picked up on. Well, one thing that, um, you know, you may notice that there are only two women writers among the uh, chapters that are included. And uh, first of all, we would like to thank um, one of our reviewers who uh, suggested that we uh, develop that part of the uh, project a little more. Uh, uh, and because Delphine de Girardin initially was not uh, included and we're so happy that um, this um, wonderful reviewer suggested it. Uh, so thank you. Uh, uh, but um, the truth is that, that they, were, they, they were not the, uh, as many women writers participating in this kind of literature at the time. And so uh, sadly, our volume reflects this gender imbalance. Um, and um, yeah, so it just- but it, but it represents a step forward already with the inclusion of those two female authors. And um, it makes me wonder too, how, how you've discussed gender in the classroom. I think Anne mentioned uh, that you wanna bring out the particular uh, class status of the authors. There's also the question of whether Balzac speak, you know, writing about in femme comme il faut is different from uh, Foy or Girardin talking about a woman. Certainly that is uh, something in, in the class that I taught on women in 19th century France. It was uh, a choice that I made in particular in that class was to not teach exclusively women authors, but rather to write about, teach authors of different genders talking about women. And so that was that was kind of a central focus of the class. And so actually in that case, a lot of the, I mean, cause like also Ambal de Grisette and uh, Physiologie de la Grisette are both written by men, Urard and de Cook. So it's an important angle to bring in if you if you happen to be using uh, any of these texts in the in a class on women in 19th century France. And in the chat too, Elizabeth Emery is giving us a fun uh, resource on music, uh, Béranger Moi, um, and is asking, uh, well, she's asking whether Béranger comes into play in the book, but maybe more generally, could you go back to the, to the idea of music and, and the vaudeville? The vaudeville was in, in I, well, I was gonna say the vaudeville was the most challenging one to translate, but I, I don't know, Masha, didn't you, didn't we often discuss that maybe Jeanne was the most challenging to translate in the end? Jeanne and Balzac were the most challenging. And, du, and Dutropon, oh gosh, Dutropon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> challenging. Um, did, did you refer to any pre-existing translations of Balzac, for example? No, no, we just did it from scratch. Um, to, to, so to go back to your uh, question about music, so you know the the, the tune is indicated in the um, in the edition in the in the vaudeville. You know it tells you what tune it's sang to. But you know to be honest, I am completely ignorant about nineteenth century music, and that would be an interesting an interesting question to think about. But I, unfortunately, I, I I don't know, Anne, that if you know anything about. <laughs> uh, well, we had a challenge with that because what we initially we had started to translate all of the titles of these songs um you know it'll say like air de and then it'll have the title uh, of the in french and so initially we thought that we would provide the translation but then we were and, and we were sort of trying to see if there had already been translated versions of these songs um and it, we found very little um despite a lot of searching. And so what we ended up deciding was that, especially even in the English translation, we would leave the titles in French so that we're a, a specialist of 19th century popular music that was not us, uh, came along and would find it useful to have the original titles that they would be there instead of a, just a kind of a translation. Um, and in both the English and French uh, versions, we have a footnote where we explain, you know, this is, these are these are songs that appeared regularly in in vaudevilles, and there's some intertextuality among the the different works. Um, but we just kind of mainly wanted to give a general flavor of what what they would have looked like. Um, so yeah, 
no, uh, we didn't, you know, try and see, we weren't able to seek out the original tunes and. <laughs> yeah, well, in, intertextuality really uh, comes through in the, in the volume. Um, I feel like you've constructed a kind of réseau, a cultural réseau that works as a whole, you know, if someone were to use uh, the volume as a textbook, uh, but also you can pull out any particular text and your notes are, are detailed enough that it can be taught separately. Um, Jennifer Forrest is pointing out that the panoramic uh, collaborative work Le Diable à Paris had Georges Sand as a contributor. And Heidi has a question, Heidi Previk Zender uh, says that her students like debating things. So she asks, which readings in the volume have you found spark the liveliest discussions in class? Any controversies? Hmm. Well, my students, um, they were uh, they were annoyed by how the grisette was depicted, honestly. And um, so in one of the chapters that we include in the um, in the Physiologie de la Grisette, for example, has this whole passage on how the, how the um, Grisette is a terrible speller. And um, so that was actually a challenge to translate because we had to figure out how to mis make the misspellings work in English. Um, but so they were frustrated by how, uh, by the kind of condescending tone that Uar took towards the grisette. Um, and so that sparked a really good discussion um, why does she seem both like, uh, why, are, why are there sort of moral stories being told about the Grisette, but she also seems to be painted as very flirty. What's the, exactly are we trying to say about the Grisette? So that was actually a very good discussion and was able, you could, you could pair it well, like we said, with other discussions of, of the similar type in, in more canonical works by Balzac and, and Hugo. So they, they got annoyed about that. So that's maybe a good one. <laughs> Um, you know, this is not a debate. My, my students absolutely loved Delphine de Girardin. They were commenting on how, what an astute observer she is. And, and you know, I was actually amazed how well they got the text, which, you know, at first when I read it, I wasn't sure, you know, how it's going to fly with, you know, the 18 to 21 crowd, but it's, it, it actually works extremely well. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to teaching it again. Um, yeah, well, um, the, the, the hour is closing. So I want to thank you again for bringing us this world of grisette and flaneur and dandies. And um, as I said, I think everyone here is going to be very excited to use this book in our teaching and our research. So thank you again, thank Masha and Anne. Thank, thank you. Thank you, um, Andrea. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'll just close things out and you guys can turn your cameras on um, to say, you know, as I mentioned, I had a little sneak preview and I used it in many of the ways that you guys said. I used the Delphine de Girardin. It was amazing, really like a wonderful addition to have a female voice in a Paris class. Um, and I used it in, um, I do similar things to Masha in terms of having my students kind of go out into New York City and be flaneur. Um, and so her observations, we, they did a writing exercise. It was actually in a writing intensive class in English that they then went into Starbucks and things back when we could have crowds. So, um, so let's stream of, of returning to crowds one day and being crowded again um, together, hopefully um, in a few months. Um, and uh, until then we will see you hopefully in February. Thank you so much to the three of you um, and please do stick around and unmute yourselves and um, thank you.